I'm impressed with all your technical knowledge. <laughs> I uh, can barely welcome, get on. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here on our Signature City YouTube page. We are really glad to have you on for our very first Signature City Presents Legendary Profiles. And today we are honored to have one of the legends of the Dallas Cowboys, one of the uh, the founding blocks of that first great offensive line uh, that led us to our first Super Bowl. Uh, we are excited to have John Nyland uh, with us. John, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really glad to have you on. Well, thank you very much. I haven't talked to you in a while, and it's just good to hit, catch up with you, Rob. Same here, and uh, it's always good to see you. And, uh, and, and, and the reason that we really wanted to start this with you is because from all, of all the people that I have met, um, you probably tell some of the greatest stories <laughs> that, I've ever, that I've heard. So, uh, Oops, but, don't tell those again, though, huh? This is correct. This is correct. This is some we will leave off. But, um, sure. uh, but I, wanted to, I wanted to talk with you and, and just kind of get – I like the, the thing about the NFL, and, and it, it, a lot of times people forget the history of it and, and what it was like in the 60s and the 70s because now they're focused on Tom Brady and – Mm -hmm. Working with all this kind of stuff, whatever. But I want to take us. I want to take you back to uh, to that young guy coming out of Iowa uh, and getting drafted. And I would like you to talk a little bit about your draft experience. Um, you know, because you were drafted both by Dallas and Oakland. So uh, how did all that play out? Well, what happened back then? You had two team. I'm sorry, two leagues fighting for the same players and negotiating for the same players. So consequently, the AFL. Back then, or I'm, I'm not sure that's what it was called, but the AFL, NFL had decided to draft on the same day. I guess they wanted the same challenge of trying to get guys in. They, they drafted the earliest they could and happened to be on the same day as the NFL. So the AFL, NFL drafting. I hear from Oakland. Oakland says, hey, we'd like to, you know, put you on a team and blah, blah, blah. And back then, we kind of negotiated our own money. Some of us had agents. Uh, I didn't particularly have an agent to start with. I did hire one eventually to finish up my contract. But bottom line is I was simply saying, hey, listen, I'm a punk kid from Amityville, Long Island, New York. I just came out of four years of college, which I had no money. My parents couldn't send me any money. There was more of a, uh, a, a, a an appreciation uh, simply because I was a good football player. They appreciated me at Iowa. Uh, but I was just basically the average student. I went to classes. I didn't want to be embarrassing to the coaches. But, you know, to me, back then, they were fighting for two teams were fighting for you on each league. And in my case, it was happened to be uh, Dallas. Uh, I also heard from Philadelphia. I also heard from uh, Denver and the AFL. And so these teams were just kind of scratch shooting, trying to see what players they could get. Uh, could we get them in the AFL? If so, how, 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 do, how far do we have to go? And that just became a negotiating with money. You know, they offered me, uh, I don't hold, quote me on exact amount, but it was like $100,000 paid out over the next 10 years. Uh, then Cowboys came in with $200,000 paid out over the next 10 years. Uh, they deferred a lot of money to the future. So obviously that saved them some time and energy. But at the same time, we, we made more money that way if we wanted to hang around and make the team. Uh, they were willing to pay us. So in my case, I got a three-year no-cut contract. Uh, it was $22,000, $26,000, along with a um, $100,000 bonus paid out over 10 years, and they got my father a car. I wanted a car. My dad okay. had no car. He had a beat-up car for all the years I grew up in, in Amityville. Uh, and, and, you know, I thought that it would be a nice gift to give my parents. My dad was really appreciated. So I said to him, you out, buy any car you want. You know, let me know what you want and I'll take care of it. And he quietly came back and said, well, I found a Nash Rambler. What? What the heck is a Nash Rambler? And he said, oh, it's great. It's got air conditioning, reverberation radio, uh, power steering. Uh, even has a convertible if I want one. I said, really? If that's what you want, go get it. And he did. He went out and got a car, and I was so proud of the fact that I could get my dad a car uh, because he, for whatever reason, uh, wasn't very uh, uh, encouraging to me, but he wasn't discouraging either. But he was my father, and I wanted to kind of, yeah. you know, look good in his eyes, at least I could try to take care of him. So I bought my dad a car. Yeah. Uh, I, I got my mother uh, – um, what did I get my mom? I got my mom furniture. I bought her a brand-new house. 
I bought wow. a brand new furniture and I moved her into a nice part of the neighborhood. And so that was my way of paying them back for all they did for me. And I was kind of, back then I was emotionally involved, but it was more of a, hey, you were my, you were my adopted parents. Why not take care of the people that brought me up and gave me this sure. opportunity? Awesome. That's fantastic. So tell us about a little bit about what it was, what life was like as a rookie uh, on the Cowboys back in 66. What's the, uh, if you were a rookie, that's one thing, but if you were a number one draft choice or number two draft choice, you were looked upon as more than a rookie. You were looked at upon as a potential starter. Somebody's going to lose their job on the offensive current line. I'm going to beat somebody out on the current line. All right. And I did uh, my rookie year. I started, uh, uh, I think there was a guy named uh, Leon Donahue. He got hurt, pulled him out of a game one game one, I believe it was and played game two, whatever. And he never got back in the game. I stepped in and I stayed there for the rest of the season. We had a good season. We made the playoffs, if you recall. Uh, and we were in the playoffs for the next 10 years. So, I guess they did something right with me by giving me the chance to perform. And yeah. I performed uh, to the best of my ability. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, your, your credentials uh, show that. Um, when you but the, but the funny part about it is, and I, I want to elaborate a little bit. You had the NFL and the AFL weren't talking to each other. They hated each other, so to speak. Right. The AFL would call me up on the phone and say, Hey John, uh, listen, I understand we're, we're getting your car. I mean, they matched everything the NFL gave me, mm -hmm. plus some. And they said, well, if you want a car, and also, we'll also give you another $10,000 for such and such. In other words, they kept upping the sea, up in the, up in the ante, up in the ante. I called the Cowboys, and I described to them what has just been offered to me from the Oakland Raiders. And they go, oh, no problem. We'll, we'll match that, and, and we'll give you some extra. You know, so it was really like I'm sitting here dumbfounded going, this is the first time this has ever happened to me. But I was sitting there saying, this is the only body I've got. I've only got one shot at it. I better make the right choice. It wasn't that I liked Dallas over Oakland. I looked at both of them on the map and went, hmm, I'm in Iowa. I'm from New York. Dallas is closer. <laughs> okay. It wasn't just a geographic decision, but I wasn't particularly interested in going to Oakland. Um, <laughs> but they were very professional about it, very honest, and uh, kept trying, even though I was very much a – you know, I had one phone on one talk. I was talking to the Oakland Raiders. On the other phone, I'm talking to the Dallas Cowboys. And that's literally how I was doing it. I put this phone down, picked this one up, and uh, the, the agent would be on there. And, you know, we were kind of saying, well, here's what Oakland's going to give me, and they're going to give me X amount of dollars, blah, blah, blah. No, no problem. We'll give you that plus. And I'm looking at these two teams going. They're going at each other. They're willing to keep upping the ante. Where does it stop? Well, eventually it stopped at the point where Oakland – said, oh, that's a little bit more and we want to pay. We'll step out. Uh, good luck. And then Denver called me. Denver called me right after that, knowing in Oakland. And I think Oakland, I think Denver drafted before Oakland. So Denver called me and said, hey, we'd like to make you number one draft choice. And I'm listening to all this conversation. And it all became very, I wouldn't call suspect, but, you know, it was like a major, major disappointment as to how the negotiations, I thought, it would handle itself. I had hired an agent. I expected him to do all this. No, no, he had me do it all. <laughs> he just he just handled the final paperwork. But, you know, to me, the game of football was very, very, at that time, very competitive, as it still is. Uh, but they were fighting for the leagues, uh, two separate leagues, two separate entities, and John Nyland was very fortunate to pick the Dallas Cowboys. And the Cowboys were fortunate as well. Absolutely. And, and, and their fans. Uh, talking about the Cowboys in, in, in those early days, I mean, that, I mean, when you got there, they were just trying to find their footing. Uh, I mean, there were only, you know, when you got there, they were really only had five seasons under their belt. And right. um, so, I, and, and when we talk about that era. Oftentimes, we always think about Coach Landry, and because he was there from the start and for decades. Talk a little bit about Coach Landry and the impact that he had on you, both as a player and as a person. Because I know a lot of the people that are tuning in are big Coach Landry fans. Well, as a player, uh, he didn't put up with anything. I mean he he was committed to everybody. Uh, he would criticize everybody in a positive way. 
he was someone that you just really, when he said something, you knew that he knew. Uh, there was something mm-hmm. about him that he said so much confidence in his offense, so much confidence in his multiple designed offense. Uh, and he had some great quarterbacks that were leading the team back then. Of course, we had Roger come along a little later. But originally, you know, we had Meredith, uh, followed by Morton, followed by, you know, Yuri Rome. We had, and, of course, when Roger came along, it just settled the whole team down. And we became a championship team because we had a championship leader. And now we had a championship coach that understood uh, and understood the players. And now we have a quarterback, Roger Staubach, or in this case, Don Meredith, who understood the coach in the sense of saying that he didn't put up with a lot of stuff. In other words, you know, it was all, once you hit that field for the next two hours, it was all business. You know, you also get the smile off your face, keep your helmet on your head unless somebody tells it off. Uh, Just, just, you know, you're there to work. You're there to learn the multiple offensive game plan of Tom Landry. And at that time he was the only major coach that had this multiple offensive game plan where he would call the same play out of 12 formations. And, and that's what made us, I think, very successful in a certain way because they couldn't give the defense enough time to adjust to the shifting going on during the snap count or right, right. before the snap count. And so that multiple offense was very confusing to the defense. It was even confusing to our defense. But the point being is that we did it in such a way that we believed in it. We believed in the end sweep, spreading the field out, get that end sweep, get that guy running around in you know, tw- uh, Tony Hill or Dwayne Thomas or, you know, any of the guys we had, Walter Garrett. Up the- we had an offensive line that could move the offensive chain of command right to the center hole of that target hole, if you would, for the game plan. If mm-hmm. that play was called, that's the target hole. But what happens if they move around? Well, then you had to automatically adjust, but not just you, the guard. You had the center adjust. You had the tackle to pay attention. You had everybody have it, and the, the backs had to pay attention because the call, the audibles they would call was often happening at the same time, at the right time that we needed it. And we had to be smart enough to know what the heck was going on. So right. the audibles, the, the multiple uh, game plan system, the, the open system of the uh, uh, spreading out the field with end runs, you know, we really kind of, I wouldn't say I revolutionized the game, but we brought it back to its original three yards in a cloud of dust, so to speak. And then, of mm-hmm. course, the big play uh, in, the, in the passing game is we had some great receivers. You know, when you stick a world's fastest human on the end and tell him to <laughs> run down the field and catch the ball, well, that's what he's going to do. And sure. That's what, that's what uh, certainly Bob Hayes did. But we yeah. had players that were very, very uh, uh, creative and very physically capable of doing some miraculous things. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You were, and, and you had a lot of talent uh, everywhere when you when you look at that 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 roster. You, you know, you talked a little bit about the about the Landry shift, uh, about the shifting, and and I've always, as a fan watching it, I always was amazed at the Landry shift, the offensive lineman, you know, up and down. And tell me the idea behind that particular movement, and and because it looks even to this day, uh, even when I see the, the the current Cowboys do it in a victory formation, they still do that in tribute to you guys uh, yep. who did that. But well, there was a reason for it, and what? And can you can tell us what that was for? Well, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, you know, the game of football, until Landry stepped on the field, really could go back to Green Bay, but Landry really, the man who stepped on the field, you knew that there's something different about him. His offensive game plan was so different that you had to adjust your defense to his game plan. You know, when you get down to it, we used to be trading each other's films from the previous games. We'd watch like the last six or seven games and literally watch the whole game. And we would really take and, and, and hold a pad and pencil. And I would, I would record everything I noticed about my defensive lineman. You know, what he did on this particular formation, what he did on that formation. And if you prepare that way, you can anticipate. Anticipation, in my opinion, is very important in football. And, of course, if you don't get what you think you're anticipating, then you have to be smart enough to adjust to it and change blocking assignments, yeah. change the technique, change the blocking angle, change the he- the helmet versus the shoulder pad. You know, there were so many things that we had to – uh, adjust to automatically right at the snap of the count that I think what it boiled down to, and, I, and I'll say this, I hope this doesn't come out 
the wrong way. But when we first stepped on the field, the first game, first training camp, we were given aptitude tests. Hmm. College entrance aptitude tests. If you didn't play very well on that aptitude test, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't make the team. Wow. And, and I found out that I was graded probably one of the highest, if not the highest on the offensive line. And that was probably one reason I made the team. I wasn't particularly big. I wasn't small, but I wasn't that big. You know, I was only six foot three, uh, 265 pounds. Well, that was pretty average, pretty small, but I was fast. I was strong up the middle, but I had a lot of good power up the middle. And so Landry played on that. He used to run a lot of plays over me because he knew I could handle that, that defensive tackle, no matter what he did, mm-hmm. no matter who he was. And, and I think he, he developed confidence in me, and that's why I stayed in my position for the next 12 years, 11 years. And, and, and to me, it was becoming a, a way of saying Coach Landry had that much confidence in me, the coach I admire, the coach that had uh, a winning tradition going and, and starting to develop a, 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 a tremendous team. And, of course, we were in the playoffs every year for the next 10 years. How do you do that? Well, you put players in place that know what the heck they're doing. They have to know. And, of course, when we were given tests, we weren't given a test just on what does John Island do on this play. I had to know what Ralph Neely did. I had to know what, uh, uh, you know, Walt Garrison did in the running back position. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about Walt Garrison. He's behind me. No, you do have to worry about Walt Garrison. You know, right. yeah, and, and – and, there was so much anticipation and thinking going on, whereas at the old days of football, I think it was pretty much three yards in a cloud of dust, block straight ahead, you know, find the open hole and go for it. That's not the offense we had. We had a multiple, complicated, charged offense of, of knowing we had the confidence of a Bob Hayes and a Walt Garrison and, and, a, and a Roger Staubach and a, and, a, and a Craig Morton. We just had such great confidence that the offensive lineman had no problem blocking for this great back that we had. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Meredith and, and Morton and of course Staubach. How different was it? Because they each had their own kind of game. I mean, Roger was more of a, you know, things got hot. He could scramble and kind of move. How, how, how different was it to block for Roger, Craig and Don? Okay. And how did you have to adjust your game? Well, Don Meredith wasn't crazy about the audible system, although he called it. And uh, but he had so much confidence in himself that often he would miscall an audible or supposed to call an audible and he didn't call it. Mm-hmm. He would just run the play we called it the huddle. Uh, but that's what his that was his personality. You know, he wasn't about to be told that this coach knew more about the quarterback position than he did. You know, he knew what he was doing. Now, granted, when he made mistakes, he certainly listened up. And uh, Landry was very patient with Don, and I think that to some degree it was one of his favorite players. And you could tell he picked favorite players, and some he would yell out and some he wouldn't. Well, Don, he didn't yell out. He never yelled at the quarterback. He never criticized the quarterback for either team and I was a run. And that was because he had such great confidence in the quarterback and didn't want to shake up his uh, – uh, I guess you want to shake up his uh, confidence. But the right. bottom line is they were both so wonderfully adapt to leading a team – with performances they knew they could perform. And it was kind of like the old day when you sit there and you get a bunch of kids together in the neighborhood, you know, here, offensive lineman, you, know, you guys block up front. In the meantime, you run all the way down the field, I'll throw you the ball. And, and that's exactly what he would do. He would say, Bob Hayes, go long, boom, I'll throw you the ball. Well, sure enough, Bob would just take off. And I'd say 50% of the time, we scored a touchdown. That's amazing. And it's amazing only because – Not a bad plan. <laughs> Not a bad plan. And you know the other yeah, quarterbacks, absolutely. We had, yeah. yeah, the other quarterbacks we had were good, but they just didn't have the leadership quality that Meredith or 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 Morton, I mean, or, or what Roger had. Right, right, yeah, and and you know that was all. It was always interesting to me because looking at the way, Mer- first of all, Meredith probably. I mean, and I've watched a lot of football too. Meredith had to be one of the toughest, toughest quarterbacks. That I've that I've ever seen. I mean, it, I mean, early on, before you even got there, he took a beating. Oh, absolutely! Uh, yeah. and, and, and just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And um, and I always wondered when when you guys when you started to form that that good that really good offensive line, um, how good he could have been had he come there a little bit later in his career. Maybe maybe you know right before that yeah. time. 
Yeah, he didn't want to quit. He didn't want to retire. He, his body yeah. retired him. You know, he didn't want sure. to take any more beat up chances. But but he got beat up early in his career. And when I got there, you know, that was the latter part of his career. And all right. of a sudden, he's he, he's uh, he's accumulating some success. And so I think it built up his confidence too. And uh, the fact that he had seen the team hire or or draft Lyman uh, mm-hmm. made a big difference. You know, you got you got you got Rayfield right. You got. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, bottom line is we had developed a good offensive line and with people we've added over the years. Sure, sure, absolutely. And Jim, so, and, and Jim Myers had a lot to do with it. He was the offensive line coach. He didn't take crap from anybody. And I liked him, too. He was just a, uh, a challenge coach, so to speak. He was never the kind mm-hmm. of guy that goes over and said, hey, good job, John. And I, I, but he would talk to you in the films. You know, hey, Niall, I see you're all pro, but that guy's all world today. You didn't do very good. <laughs> he had that type of comment uh, that, that would laugh and make fun of, but the bottom line is he was fairly serious, too. Right. I, right. I took it serious. When I saw a guy beat me, it didn't happen very often, but when it happened, you know, you look at yourself and say, what do I have to do to change to beat this guy in the future? That's the thing I believe I made myself pretty good at it. I didn't. I, I kept good notes. I would keep a good file on every player. Uh, I kept it at my home. I would record information on after the game, how I played. I would try to ad- adapt information to things I did wrong when I played for, because we play them twice a year. Uh, and every year, you know, we play the same. Is that you or me? Uh, it wasn't me. Sean. I'm getting a loud buzz in this thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's all right. I don't hear it on our end. I don't know. Might be I don't know what's causing it either. Now I hear it. <laughs> what's that noise? Huh? Yeah, that's not going to do it. Can you hear him? Can you hear him? It's too loud. It's too loud. Man. Oh, okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep, I hear you perfect. No buzzing. Okay. Unplug your... Unplug this thing right here. Technical difficulty. <laughs> can we not hear you? No. Okay. You, you can hear me? Can you hear me now? We can't hear him. Um, you can't? Technology is awesome, but when it doesn't work, it doesn't we work. On? Wait. No, he's not plugged in. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. We back on? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Okay. There you go. Awesome. Let's call it. My electrician's here. It's always good to have an IT person right handy. Hey, she's smarter than I am. I mean, you know, if you talk to her, you think better of me. I heard that <laughs> one. And that's a true story about us. If you talk to her, you'll think a lot better of me. I understand. I got I one too. So, you know, one of the things I found interesting is that you played on back to back Super Bowl teams. Winning the second one, but you you did it with two starting quarterbacks, um, and and that's real testament to the team itself, the team concept that you that you had. But I want to really talk about the, the Super Bowl six when you won it. And what just what was it? take us back? What was it like to finally win that game? And then what was the locker room like afterward? Oh, it, it, the locker room was ridiculously wild and crazy. I mean, we were so. So excited. I mean, look at all the years we were in the playoffs. And now all of a sudden, you know, after four or five years of trying to make the playoffs uh, and then all of a sudden getting into the playoffs in 65 uh, yeah. and, then, you know, moving up the ranks, so to speak, into the Super Bowl rank. Uh, we just knew we were going to make it to the Super Bowl and we knew we were going to win it. Now, again, right. that's just that's not being sarcastic when I say that, but we just knew we were that good. Now, I'm not saying that we could say to each other, hey, you're a pretty good ball player. No, that's not what Landry wanted in mind. But Landry made us what we were because he put the team positions together, and he was smart enough to know that this change has to come next year. This change ought to be improved next year. Here, we got to make this. Uh, and, you know, he would look over his entire game plan from the years before and adjust them. And he was a smart man. I mean, the man was very intelligent. You talk football, he was all X's and O's. But, you know, he was such a quiet person. Um, he wasn't very gregarious. He wasn't much on personality. Uh, it doesn't mean he was a wrong or he wasn't bad. But it was hard to get to know him. You know, he kept very mm-hmm. stoic, stand away, 
Uh, you know, I'm the coach. You sit there and listen to what I have to say. At least that's how I interpreted it. But, uh, you know, I got to know him pretty well. And I took him by the hand one day. And we sat and talked. And, you know, he was a regular guy. He's a normal guy. But he so loved the game of football and was so smart. And, and so preparing for the upcoming game, that's what he did. He prepared well. He was well prepared. He prepared in the offseason for the games coming up for the season. You know, he looked it over in the offseason. They'd go over all the films and grade all the films. And, you know, you come out of the season saying, this is why you won. This is why you lost. You got to know how to adjust your formation, your talent, your ability, your men, and your game plan to a new formation of thinking. And that was we were going to win. We knew when we got to the playoffs in 66, we knew we had something. And we stayed there for four or five years, finally get to the Super Bowl. We lost it, came back next year. We knew we were going to win it. Yeah. It was almost like, a, it was almost like the game plan was set, set in motion before, uh, before I even joined the team. I mean, he knew he was going to be in the playoffs probably within five years. He, he had that game plan. And uh, he knew he knew what players he needed to get there. Getting to the Super Bowl once is a major accomplishment. Getting okay. to it and winning it a second time is fantastic. But then when you look at the team that you beat, the Dolphins, it, you know, just the very next year, that team, pretty much the same team, went undefeated. Actually, and then we won win back-to-back Super Bowl. So um, that Super Bowl six win – is even more impressive when you consider who it was you beat and you, who you beat pretty handily. Right. So, um, you know, it was uh, for Cowboy fans, I think, uh, for those of us who are old enough to have remembered it and watched it when it happened, uh, was great. But as, as for Cowboy fans that are, that are younger that go back and look at it, I, I hope that they appreciate that accomplishment uh, and, and really what it was rather than just being another Super Bowl win, because it certainly wasn't just another Super Bowl win. It was a it was a it was a thing of beauty, really. Well, as I said earlier, it is so hard to get to the playoffs. First of all, there's really three seasons. You, you get to the playoffs. That's your first season. You got to win through the playoffs to get to the Super Bowl. That's your second season. And of course, the Super Bowl itself, that's your third and final season about this whole thing. And so for that reason. Somebody's phone's ringing. Okay. And for that reason, you know, we had a perspective to what we were doing. Uh, we had no questions whatsoever. I was always embarrassed to be interviewed the year we won the Super Bowl because I was so confident it may have came off as cockiness, but we were so confident. You know, I played against Bob Hines. Well, I can tell you everything about Bob Hines to this day mm-hmm. because I studied him, you know, studied him. He was a good ball player. And uh, that's the defensive tackle I went against. And there's some other, they shifted gears, a few people in there. But, you know, he, he, had, he encouraged the players to take these films home because these films were available to us sure. and study them and study them. And you, you can't, you can't tell how much that impressed me to where he didn't say, Hey, you got to go home and study these and come on back tomorrow and know them. No, no, you go home and study them because you're going to use these the rest of your life. These talents that you're going to use on this one man is going to be a talent that you may use on somebody else you play against in the near future. So develop that talent, develop that style, develop that whatever. You know, Bob Lilly had a great story. You know, he, he put your face mask and, and come at you his first time in the face mask. And if he could hit that defensive tackle in the first mask, he was at an advantage because now he made a blink. And yeah. uh, an offensive lineman blinks, tackles past you. Yeah. So you got to learn to keep your eyes open, even coming into the face mask. It's a it's a natural reaction to blink. But you couldn't right. do that. I, I taught guys not to blink, and that was yeah. taught to me not to blink, not to blink. Too many guys yeah. had a problem with that. But that small little talent that Landry recommended and suggested developed my style of football much better than if I hadn't known that particular uh, technique, if you will. Uh, right. you know, I never, I never, I never closed. I never, I never kept my eyes open when I got hit in the face mask. I blinked every few mm-hmm. college or anything, but when I hit the pros, I had to study that and that make a difference. And that's really, I wouldn't say that was a major difference in my blocking assignment, but I could, I could follow that lineman because I never closed my eyes on. Him. Right. And if he came after me and tried to take me, you know, like Lily would do it in practice a lot of times, he'd tell me upset. He said, but, uh, John, we're going full potatoes today. Well, full potatoes means he was going to smack me in a helmet 
and right in the face mask. And he's going to see how tough I am. <laughs> and, and we had some good blocking assignments against each other. And, of course, I think I helped Bob. And I probably would tell you, to be honestly, what if a Bob Lilly, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Really? That's how good he was. And that's yeah. how much he taught me. And that's how much I respected his his uh, his advice. That's fantastic. Um, you know, you've Pro Bowls, All Pros, um, Super Bowl wins, all that kind of stuff. If you had one chance to relive one memory, <laughs> if you go back and just do one memory over again, what would it be? <laughs> okay, it was a playoff season. I think it was the Super Bowl season. Maybe it was the season before. Anyway, we were playing Minnesota Vikings, and Alan Page was just named NFL Lineman of the Year, Defensive Lineman of the Year, and I had to play him that weekend. Well, I won't tell you how well I played against him, but go ask, go ask uh, Alan Page. Is he still alive? Okay. By the way? Is he is he passed away? No, he's still around. Go ask Alan Page who won that game that day. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, respectfully so. I mean, he, I didn't beat him up on every play, and he didn't beat me up on every play. But we played a heck of a tough game. And I think he respected me, and I certainly respected him. And, again, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for guys like that I had to play against because I had mm -hmm. to get better. I had to get better than I was. And that became a matter of, uh, of, uh, of choice because some players don't get better. They just try to make it. You know, they kind of – they made the team, the backup quarterback or a backup linebacker or a backup whatever – you know, some people just want to be on the team. Well, I didn't want to be on the team. I want to play. Yeah. And, and so for me, uh, I was just so very focused on on playing the game that um, players, I think defensive defensive linemen would vote you into the Pro Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I got voted in the Pro Bowl the six years of my life at the end of my career. Uh, every year I was in the Pro Bowl. Well, that tells you something about the guys I played against because they were the ones that voted. Absolutely. Defensive, defensive linemen, both for the offensive guards, linemen, and then offensive guards, linemen, both for the defensive linemen. So that's a true picture of who's kicking your butt. Yeah. And, and that's, you know what, that's probably the best way that uh, that they should be voting for the uh, for the Pro Bowl. Yeah, and I think they still do to some degree, although I, I know I voted in the Pro Bowl against uh, offensive linemen. I'm sorry, defensive linemen I played against. Right. Whether they still do that today, I don't know. I, um, I think it's a mix. I think I think uh, there's some fan voting that's able to be incorporated into it. And, yep. of course, the players do vote. I think they just get a whole sheet and they say, pick pick this and pick that. But, um, I agree. You know, but you, I, I like the way you did it. Um, okay, one last question that I think everybody wants to know. Since you retired, talk a little bit about what's been keeping you busy, what have you been doing, and what have you been up to? Well, after I retired, I was working for a chemical company when I played football. We didn't make the kind of money they're making today. You know, we were making $26,000 a year, not $360,000. Anyway, um, uh, so I had an office season job. I worked for a television station for a while, minimum. And then I worked for a chemical company. I'm in sales right to this day. I'm still in the concrete business today. And right now I'm selling concrete for Nelson Brothers Concrete here in Louisville. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, I want to talk about one more thing before we let you get out of here. And I want to make mention of it. Uh, there is uh, an effort underway right now to get you uh, inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Very well deserved, by the way. If you go to Facebook, which I think everybody and their brother now is on Facebook one way or the other, there is a John Nyland for the Pro Football Hall of Fame page. Uh, I would encourage people to go and uh, go to that page, like the page, and then uh, and, and not only that, but just make some comments on there if you've, if you've watched John play. Uh, sure. But if you haven't, if you didn't see him firsthand, I, I promise you, if you go back and you can find a, just one game, if you just go back to the Super Bowl VI uh, videos, go back, and if you can watch the whole game, do it, and watch John. John was one of the most athletic offensive linemen ever. I mean, this John Nyland was – Orlando Pace before Orlando Pace. Uh, John <laughs> Allen was Larry Allen before Larry Allen. Okay. And, and because the, the way he played, he was asked to pull, he was asked to do a lot of things. And when you look at the game, you're going to be very hard pressed to find an offensive play that John isn't in the middle of making a block or being downfield or doing something. So check it out. 
Um, and if you are, if you feel led, and uh, I hope you do because I'm one of them, uh, write a letter to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, just nominating John uh, for for induction. Because uh, I have said this before, there is a John Nyland size hole in the Hall of Fame, and there's only one guy that can fill that, and and that's John. So I would appreciate you guys doing uh, doing that, and I know you would as well. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Absolutely. All right. One more quick note before we uh, before we get out of here. Uh, we, as as I mentioned before in a previous uh, video, uh, we are partnering with After the Impact Fund. Uh, if you will go to afterthepact.org uh, and check them out, they help uh, former NFL players, uh, first responders, uh, former military personnel uh, as they transition out of their those lives into civilian lives. They help them with all kinds of things in in terms of. Uh, some medical and some peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, help uh, just to try to help them make that transition. Uh, please go to uh, aftertheimpact.org, check them out. And one more announcement, I uh, also want to mention that uh, on September 19th in Frisco, uh, Signature City, we'll be uh, having our, our next event there. And we're going to have Bob Lilly and Cornell Green, a couple of your former uh, teammates. Right. And it's going to be at 3.30. Uh, it's going the tickets to be on sale at signaturecityllc.com uh, very soon. So keep checking back for that. So, all right, all those housekeeping things are out of the way. <laughs> well, what date was that again that the Bob's going to be out there? Uh, September 19th. Got it. Yeah, Saturday before the Falcons game. Okay. Providing we have a game, <laughs> <laughs> which I think we will. Um, but, uh, but John, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. I appreciate the time. Uh, I, and, uh, I always enjoy talking with you and, uh, the stories and, and folks, this is just, this is just the surface of the stories that John has. Uh, I, I had the pleasure uh, of spending a day with John, um, a, a couple years ago and, and, and I mean, pretty much the day. And the stories uh, about that early Cowboys, uh, those early Cowboy teams, fantastic. And it just gave me such a deep appreciation for what they went through and for what John uh, brought to the table. So um, thanks again for that, John. We appreciate it. Uh, everybody, uh, keep watching this channel. Come back uh, often. Check it out. Subscribe to it uh, down at the bottom. Check that bell uh, to get notifications uh, when we go live. And um, We'll look forward to uh, talking to you again. So, guys, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Rob.